This is a story about risk, about the chances which we know we take and those decisions which we're prepared to let others make on our behalf. It's a story about the costs and benefits of doing one thing or another, or maybe even doing nothing. But most of all, it's a story about something which happened here in Berkshire in November last year, which has forever changed the lives of many families in the West Country. I felt a bump and I thought it was just like a tree trunk or something because I wouldn't have expected what happened. And then suddenly the train started to shake. The Ufton Nervert rail crash killed the car driver and six people on the train, including its driver, Stan Martin from Torquay, and 14-year-old Emily Webster from Dockham near Exeter. Well, I was sitting opposite my daughter uh, in a rear-facing seat, my daughter forward-facing. Um, we were going along, for, just left uh, Reading Station after having a, a meal on the train. Um, we, everything was going normal, we'd picked up speed and suddenly we had uh, quite a violent shudder in the train as the brakes of the train started to be applied. And I felt a jolt. And when I looked up, I could see the curved ceiling of the carriage beginning to sway violently from side to side. This sort of gave us quite a bit of concern, but at that point in time, we, we were trying to work out actually what was happening. Um, it was unusual. We'd never felt anything like it before, but we weren't too alarmed. Uh, and that carried on for probably about two seconds before we felt a bang as the train obviously impacted with the car. Um, immediately at that point in time, the lights went out, uh, so we had no way of orienting ourselves inside the carriage. Uh, the train started to leave the tracks and you could feel uh, it bumping along. The crash was exceptionally violent. The train had been travelling at nearly 100 miles an hour. Mr Martin had no chance to avoid the collision. And suddenly I saw all weird food on the table because we were just eating dinner fly towards Peter and the train start, carriage started tipping to the right. And it was slowly at first and then suddenly it started to speed up. And I tried to grab at the underneath of the table, but because it's flat I couldn't grab anything. And I next thing I knew I was lying on the floor and we had fallen through the side window and the glass had broken and the train carriage had continued moving up. And then within a second or so, it hit the points, the point system, which was uh, shortly after the crossing. And then that made the train go in all different directions. Uh, and we had an extremely violent flip from one side to the other, which sent uh, people flying from their seats in the dark. Um, and uh, really there was no way of, of knowing where anybody was. It's difficult to remember in detail what happened blow by blow after that, except that it really was blow by blow, because I was either thrown to the floor or instinctively dropped to the floor. I'm, I'm not sure which of those it was. And then I think that, that my laptop flew from the table and, and hit my head, which was why I had a a head injury, and then I was just flung violently from side to side as the carriage, obviously the train was decelerating, and as the carriage rocked violently from side to side, every time there was another rock, I hit another hard surface. It literally flipped so quickly, it's, you can't even record it. It happened extremely violently. Um, and so people were literally thrown from their seats. 
one might think that they're thrown in a forward action, but obviously in, in the way that our carriage went, they were thrown sideways, literally out of their seat. And I described it in, in one thing, like being in a tumble dryer, you literally were just thrown around. The crash sent shockwaves through the rail industry. The immediate question, still unanswered, focused on whether the car driver had deliberately placed his vehicle in the path of the train. Rail unions repeated their demand for half-barrier crossings to be phased out of the network. Politicians were more cautious. We need to find out exactly what happened in relation to this, how it was that the car came to be on the crossing, and uh, to look at the circumstances that followed immediately uh, following that collision. Once we know what has happened, we will then need to learn the lessons uh, that uh, flow from that. But at the moment, uh, we must allow the investigation to be completed uh, and uh, we must concentrate on that and then uh, decide what is best to be done. The interim report from the Rail Safety and Standards Board drew attention to broken windows in some rail carriages, which had what it described as severe consequences for passengers thrown towards them. It wasn't long before survivors began campaigning for improved safety measures inside the train. The question of whether trains should be fitted with seat belts brought a petition to 10 Downing Street and a debate in Parliament. Health and safety on the railway, Richard Younger Ross. There have been several rail crashes in recent memory and there's plenty of data on which to base policy. But experts remain divided over what is the best thing to do. Carriages are, very, are designed very much for the function which they are needed for, which means that passenger safety is not necessarily the highest priority. The priority seems to be much greater on providing the, uh, the environment to carry the passengers. Uh, and I guess from the point of view of the accident statistics, that, that may be justifiable because travel on rail transport is relatively safe, for example, compared to cars. However, in the case when you do get an impact, um, a lot of train structures, even some of the newer ones, are not, do not have the best crash-worthy performance. And it's necessary then to provide additional means to ensure the survival of the passengers. A lot of work has been done in the other transport industries, such as the road industry and the aviation industry. Uh, but we can't assume that the safety solutions developed from those industries can be transferred directly into the rail situation. For instance, in an aircraft cache, there will, there will obviously be a high vertical component to the impact. And in a car crash, you're seated very close to the structures, the steering wheel, the door, the window, and so on. All these things are very different in a train. We have a, a very wide compartment, and the severity of the impacts will be very different as well. So we can't assume that those safety measures can be immediately applied to a train and be effective. One result of the accident is that I am very interested now when I'm on a train about every movement that the train makes. I think I'm much more aware of trains swaying because the instinctive reaction to that is, it's, is it happening again? Um, the first time I got on a train after the accident was to go to the memorial service in Reading. And I was really interested then because I wanted to try and fit together for myself where those little lights were that were used immediately after the crash happened. And that was the first time, I confess, I had ever looked at the safety card in a train. Rail crash investigators quickly established that the train, track, signalling equipment and the normal features associated with the Ufton nerve at crossing were all working as they should. But campaigners think the experts could be missing the point. My feeling is that the report is quite mechanistic. It describes in detail what happens to the train, how it performs, whether there were faults on the line, whether there were faults with the train. It, it's, it's quite detailed in that respect and talks about the weather and what happened to the passengers afterwards going to local hospitals and pubs. But it doesn't talk about what happened to the passengers, how they were killed, what happened to them, how could we prevent those things, what were any contributory factors. My feeling is it's sort of saying, well, there's nothing wrong with the train, there's nothing wrong with the track, and, and, and just 
not actually examining how we could actually prevent the crash in the first place and then uh, actually reduce the number of people who died and reduce the injuries. Part of the problem is untangling the labyrinth of overlapping lines of responsibility between a variety of agencies, executives, boards, departments and private companies which now make up Britain's fragmented rail industry. Ultimately, the buck stops on the desk of the government minister responsible for the railways. We'll be talking to him in a couple of minutes. Join us again after the break. What would happen if rail passengers demanded that train carriages be fitted with seat belts? Quite possibly the cost of a train ticket would go up, but maybe more importantly, the train companies would find it impossible to sell you a ticket unless they could guarantee that you would get a seat. In 1999, following a train crash in Finland, the Finnish Rail Authority conducted a small experiment with seat belts. It fitted a total of 271 belts in just three carriages and monitored the reaction of passengers. Although nearly 70% of passengers thought seat belts were a good idea, only 1% had actually used them. The Finnish researchers nevertheless concluded that more trains should be fitted with seat belts. Meanwhile, another rail crash in England suggested that anything which could impede the escape of passengers from a fire might do more harm than good. We drew a number of conclusions from the uh, Labro Grove uh, disaster. Um, the difficulty people experienced in evacuating uh, the railway carriage meant that there was a lot of things that uh, you could do to improve the, the design of the railway carriage. For example, the way the uh, carriage end doors opened and closed. Uh, if you have a carriage that, that tips over on its side, you'd like the doors to, uh, to, to fail safe so that they open. Um, in the event that you can't get the doors open, you'd like to have some means by which you can um, easily uh, remove the partition in the door. For example, having a gasket that you can pull to take out the central partition. Um, another finding from the uh, uh, Labra Grove uh, disaster was that uh, uh, the need to be able to break windows relatively easily, uh, the number of hammers you need, the positioning of hammers, the instructions people need to, um, to operate hammers to, 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 to break windows, the issue of seat belts on trains, the instructions that people receive uh, in the event of an evacuation, the, the actual leaflets and, and passenger information leaflets needed to be improved. The Ladbroke Grove rail disaster certainly highlighted the need to escape a fire. In recent years, though, fires on trains have been extremely rare. In the United States, the Federal Railroad Administration has studied exhaustively the subject of carriage design. It concluded that, on balance, seat belts would improve passenger safety. Researchers also called for more soft materials to absorb impacts inside the carriage. Nearly all the experts agree that one relatively cost-effective way of making carriages safer is simply to rearrange the seats. The seating arrangements aren't necessarily the uh, best to ensure survival of a passenger in a, in a crash. Some of the features like um, open bays with tray tables in them um, in a lot of cases there, the, the table is, is a functional item for putting drinks, books on, but in the event of a crash, the tray table is very much on the level of a person's abdomen, which is the very vulnerable area. So an immediate effect could be had by just taking out all the tables, which, which would be very beneficial. But then even the general seating arrangements, if the seats were all turned to be unidirectional, then there would be a better chance of retaining people within their immediate zone during a crash. In a, in a train, you want to retain people within a, 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 a survival space which can provide the necessary conditions to ensure their survival. And that would include also the ability of the glazing to retain the people inside. So moving to a laminated glazed uh, glazing would be beneficial in retaining the people, provided there was some mechanism which would allow people to smash the glass uh, if they needed to escape through it. 
Another recurring theme over the years is frustration at how difficult it is to find out who's responsible for safety on the railways. Who sets the standards and why are they not applied uniformly across the network? Well, the Health and Safety Executive is the independent safety authority for a range of industries. For the rail industry, the Railway Inspectorate actually enforces the health and safety legislation on behalf of the Health and Safety Executive. Health and safety legislation on the rail covers the employers, the employees and other persons who are likely to be affected by those activities and it places a duty on the rail operators to actually control the risks associated with the railways. Well obviously we take advice from the experts with the health and safety executive um, and sort of talk to the, the rail uh, safety and standards board. Um, and really it's, just, it's important that we, we take that advice, um, so in, in doing that we weigh up the decision then in, in, in light of that particular advice. And in terms of seatbelts, well as you know the investigation is currently taking place and uh, research uh, by the Rail uh, Safety and Standards Board uh, into the pros and cons of this and uh, we're awaiting uh, that evidence and research before we make any decision. If you go on any train you will find that there is information at usually the vestibule ends of the carriages there is also in-house magazines that explain the emergency evacuation procedures and also you've got the windows, if the windows are on the train, that are marked as emergency exits. I think the important thing is that the research is actually pointing us to away from emergency evacuation for most incidents, it's, actually to, it's safer to remain within the body of the train and allow normal uh, access and escape by means of the emergency services. More than 10 years ago, the rail industry agreed that new passenger carriages should be fitted with windows made from laminated glass rather than the toughened glass used in old rolling stock. But the regulation was not retrospective. So while Virgin and GNER trains use laminated glass, First Great Western's older carriages continue to use toughened glass. There is no uniform minimum standard. The toughened glass um, is relatively easy to break. If you have a hammer on board you, and if you hit the window in the appropriate way you can, you can break the glass and it provides a means to escape. If you have laminated glass on the other hand, which is the trend in a lot of the uh, new rolling stock that's coming in, you cannot break the laminated glass. Well obviously we have to take advice from the health and safety executive but what's important is that there are issues around both um, in terms of what's best, in terms of the the, the glass that can come out more easily, then close to the issues that we we're concerned about in terms of vandalism and uh, problems on our railways that might make that difficult. On the other hand, uh, toughened glass has its own problems in terms of people being able to get out of the carriage. So it's difficult to make the, the judgment in, in terms of... Uh, we've got to make that judgment in, in light of the information and advice that we're given. As far as the government is concerned, there are currently more questions than answers. A popular answer with successive ministers over the years seems to be simply to commission more research. This dummy has enabled us to develop interiors of trains that are designed to protect in the event of a crash. So, for instance, rather than the very hard and rigid seats and tables that we've had until recently that would actually cause quite severe injuries, these structures are now designed to absorb energy absorb the motion of a person in the event of an accident and actually offer a good level of protection. In terms of how long this will take and whether or not we would allow the research to carry on, do we set deadlines, clearly colleagues within HSE are actually working in partnership with the industry. We're sitting alongside them doing the research. If we felt that for any commercial reasons, for example, this was being delayed, we would act as the independent regulator to ensure that you know commercial considerations one issue but if there are real lessons to be learned and control measures to be implemented we'd be pushing those through. Current research on seat belts commissioned nearly two years ago is due to report later this year. First Great Western declined to be interviewed for this program but a spokesman said the company was considering issues such as seat belts and laminated glass windows as part of the overall refurbishment of carriages over the next decade. We have the engineering to make the difference now. The, it is a political decision on en enforcing some basic rules and regulations would actually, which, pr which would provide the conditions to improve safety. My husband took me to the station and I wasn't actually travelling by First Great Western on that occasion. But when a First Great Western train pulled into the station, 
I burst into tears, um, which is not like me at all. <laughs> if there is another train accident, as there probably will be, and we have a similar type of result, at least we can then say, look, you knew that, why didn't you do anything about it? Emily Webster's family can never recover from the Ufton Nervic crash. Christine Panton's scars are mending, but other wounds will never heal. Lots of lacerations and my knee jars up all the time, so having physio for that and the nerves have died and the feeling won't come back there. You can't really ever recover fully. I'm getting better. I'd say instead of crying for hours every day, now I cry just a bit every day, but it gets less, but it never goes away. And what do you think about travelling by train? I'd never go on a train again. No, that killed my friend and I'm not going on it. All the experts agree that anything which encourages rail passengers to stop using the trains and travel by road instead will ultimately kill more people. On the same day that six died on the first Great Western Express here last November, ten people were killed in accidents on Britain's roads. Ten more were killed the day after, and a similar number are killed in accidents on Britain's roads every day. But the experts also agree that that is no excuse for doing nothing about rail safety. As for seat belts, the official Ufton Nerva crash report simply repeats the industry's long-held position and calls for more research.